Hello, my paper is titled Multi-Ethnic Collaboration, Story Worlds, and Environmental Justice, Book Objects, and Modeled Encounters. Thank you for taking the time to engage with my presentation. I'm eager for comments to improve the ideas and for suggestions about collaborations in line with the examples I will end with. My paper begins with the observation that much scholarship and literary studies having to do with environmental justice focuses on single authored texts. Larger projects, such as book-length ones that aim for a multi-ethnic range of environmental justice issues, while perhaps bypassing being confined to a single racial or ethnic focus, nonetheless tend to segment their parts according to these categories. Scholarship in the social sciences, by contrast, um, offer and has offered for decades repeated cases for reflecting on the multi-ethnic histories and successes of environmental justice movements and their narratives. Combining insights from this scholarship with my pre-existing work in eco-narratology, I want to underscore why literary studies' is default to single-authored text matters. Being mindful of texts that emerge from collaboration, I'm arguing, will help eco-criticism work toward a broader, multi-ethnic environmental justice approach that might better reflect and motivate grassroots work and organizing. So in brief, my claim is that focusing on single author texts, even when they have multiple and diverse narrators, risks folding back into racial projects that enforce racial typification and monolithification rather than breaking down barriers to inclusive diverse movements. This is by no means to suggest that we should stop reading or studying single authored works, uh, but does encourage me to promote the underdocumented value of multi-authored collaborations in our research and teaching. While a search for multi-ethnic and environmental justice yields very little literary scholarship, it does surface arguments from the social science disciplines dating as far back as the 1990s. From the outset, I should note that the social sciences are by no means settled on the topic, despite the head start. For example, we can note that two articles, each about the purported successes of organizers for two different CAFE acronymed organizations, the Carolina Alliance for Fair Employment and the Community Alliance for the Environment come to precisely the opposite conclusions. So the Carolina-based worker organization found success bringing whites and blacks together by not foregrounding the environment, favoring a multi-issue organization essential to building an oppositional ideology that can connect local struggles to broader social and economic justice issues and provide a grassroots base for a larger movement and making a case based on participants identifying with workers' issues and local residency. By contrast, a later study from 2001 by anthropologist Melissa Checker found that CAFE activists developed expansive environmental narratives that created a broad-based environmental justice identity that enabled them to extend their cooperation to a host of social justice issues. While these studies observe opposite dynamics for the potential of the environment to motivate collectives, they indicate the social sciences pre-existing attention to collective environmental narratives, yet they do not employ methods and insights from humanist study of narrative, which I will return to. Indispensably within the deeper scholarly conversation about multi-ethnic collaborations for environmental justice in the social sciences, I argue, the scholarship from the 1990s on multi-ethnic environmental justice includes Laura Polito's a critical review of the methodology of environmentalism research, environmental racism research, the prescience of which has single-handedly provoked much of the thinking undergirding my paper here. For one, Polito's study has clarity in its use of terms that is helpful for thinking through multi-ethnic collaboration and movements. Polito begins by noting that studies of environmental racism have multiple interests, including differential exposure to toxics, the most commonly invoked form of environmental racism, but also issues such as the elitism of mainstream environmental concerns, underrepresentation of people of color in environmental organizations, and discriminatory dimensions of policymaking. But while environmental racism is inherently and always environmental injustice, not all environmental injustice is exclusively or primarily environmental racism based. And so here we can think about cases of poor whites as also and often alongside low income and racialized communities being prone to disproportionate exposure to toxics Based on methodological conflicts in the social sciences generally and critical geography in particular, Polito announces um, from early on the importance of attending to unspoken political projects that lurk beneath the surface of scientific inquiry, including implicit understandings of what racism is, what it looks like, and how it functions. 
she reframes those projects uh, in terms of Winant's notion of racial projects, which interpret, represent, and explain racial dynamics to organize and distribute resources along particular racial lines. And through this contrast, if more implicitly than explicitly, Polito makes a final terminological point that not all environmental injustice studies or projects are necessarily environmental justice oriented. It is possible to study or even advocate against environmental injustice in ways that lose sight of the broader environmental justice goals. And to this point, she raises examples of racial nimbyism, where the goal sometimes amounts to getting something out of one backyard only to have it end up in another instead of tackling the broader problem of relying on toxic infrastructures, etc. While Polito's survey uncovers whiteness in ostensibly colorblind empiricist statistical studies, her more surprising criticisms for literary studies might cut the other way, such as her observations noting how even putatively anti-racist projects become racial projects that reinstate racialized inequities um, and block multi-ethnic grassroots coalition building. The strategic shift coalescing environmental justice activism around environmental racism, she notes, has obscured participation by whites in early anti-toxics movements, often implied the construction of a monolithic non-white community, and it also allows racial policies to be adopted, which only makes possible partial redress of inequities because factors like income levels do so often layer into environmental justice, injustice and its operations. The final issue raised by Polito is that academic projects appropriation of race rhetoric to advocate for interventions in legal and public policy areas has at times participated in the actual diminishment of these analytics power at the grassroots level. Um, Polito's notes about the under-acknowledged multi-ethnic roots of the environmental justice movement and how the consensus view of war and county as the official start to the movement is itself a narrative with an attendant racial project is supported by Tracy Perkins, whose 2021 article argues in regards to environmental justice work in California that focusing on the black civil rights origin of EJ to the exclusion of other contributing movements and early sites of EJ protest limits our understanding of the breadth of political traditions on which EJ activists drew at multiple sites of struggle. By contrast, Perkins's interview informed histories narrated by participants in multiple California-based protesters and organizations, um, encourages understandings of racialized organizing traditions linked to place and the interplay, or as she terms it, spillover, of local and national sites and rhetorics of struggle. Against the backdrop of conventional linear accounts of EJ as a movement, Perkins's work complicates the typical social movement origin stories by tracking protest and other social movement activities that cluster in cycles or waves of protest. Even within racial categories, her interviews with Oakland-based Black Panther, um, sorry, <laughs> even within racial categories, her interviews with Oakland-based Black Panthers attests that racial projects vary across not only time, but also space. Essentially, Perkins's work buttresses Polito's 1996 arguments by again asking scholars to locate their invocations of terms like environmental racism and environmental justice within specific, not general, uh, social and intellectual histories and narratives, and Perkins's interview-driven methods drive home the networked and narrative forms of those histories. Notably, in Perkins's findings, multiple tellers over time have given uh, and invoked environmental racism, uh, giving it perhaps a collective meaning but only through collaboration and corroboration. Literary studies invoking EJ are not exempt from the problematic tendencies Polito and Perkins Lim in the studies I have just summarized. The multi-ethnic convergences suggested by the social science studies I have mentioned so far are underrepresented generally, and when mentioned are observed at the level of content in single authored works. I wanted to offer a survey of several articles here to bear out this point, but the timing of this paper has proved prohibitive to doing that well, so I want to offer up one salient example and just note here that I have a series of other studies I'm thinking of um, alongside Polito and Perkins's claims, and I would be happy to discuss those further. So on the blatant end of studies with racial projects that fall short of imagining broader and more transformative efforts toward environmental justice, Elias Hanafi's proposal for a spatial reformation, sorry, spatial formation theory highlights the specificities of the African-American experience that argues 
for redress of the potential experience of other ethnic groups. Hanafi's framing of environmentally racist exposure citing as a specifically African-American problem articulates its rationale deliberately via comparison. Quote, while cognizant of the ample evidence advanced by EJ literature indicating the exposure of disadvantaged communities across the color class spectrums to environmental sectors, albeit in very varying degrees, end quote, um, and she emphasizes that last point, uh, albeit in varied degrees with long dashes, quote, the spatial formation theory draws particular attention to the African-American community, since unlike other racial and ethnic groups, African-Americans have been the only group in America that has been the victim of consecutive episodes of subjugation in the form of enslavement and informal segregation, she writes, end quote. Uh, readers of her endnotes may also be surprised to learn that, quote, even the case of Native Americans' exposure to environmental toxins is significantly different from African Americans for the simple fact that the former's residential isolation has been much more due to the group's choice to live in reservations and protect their culture than to the institutionalized policies of residential segregation that the latter have been subject to." End quote. As in the explicit misunderstanding of injustice to indigenous peoples here or the broader gestural othering of groups outside Hanafi's focus, the, this project um, of hers demonstrates how racial projects, even when undertaken to move past impasses for specific communities, can entrench or ignore injustices against others. In Hanafi's and various other studies, what I'm underscoring is the way that incorporation of environmental justice critique most often occurs without situating the term in intellectual history and with a focus on specific racial or ethnic groups in ways that obscure more than they facilitate possibilities to launch critiques of environmental racism or injustice, or to imagine environmental justice outside the historical and textual foci of studies as examples. Of course, literary studies of environmental justice have been doing the indispensable work called for by Polito and obviously many others to better understand racism and colonialism's operations. It also deserves noting that the structure of doctoral programs and literature hires more often than not discourages broad multicultural work in favor of specialization in one racial or ethnic tradition, and I'm not specifically interested here in arguing the merits of that tendency. What I am arguing is that these articles bear out um, a humanity's emphasis on specificity and specific injustices that has not engaged, as have the social sciences, with the broader and interrelating social movements that might turn these works insights towards collaborative environmental justice action outside the academic analysis. One area of environmental justice work in communication and literary studies that does seem promising for linking specific studies to coalitional, multi-ethnic, and movement building insights comes from scholars focusing on relationships between environmental justice, storytelling, and narration. For her part, Elizabeth Dickinson self-consciously practices story writing as a way to expose and critique environmental racism in a method reminiscent of the narrative eco-criticism long practiced by eco-critics, including Scott Slovak and many others. Um, Summer Harrison's Isle published article on Ruth Ozeki's My Year of Meats makes the point with more heft than Dickinson, I think, with thoughts that go beyond the widely repeated weak claim of narrative's ability to depict or make visible that underpins Dickinson's point. Harrison writes, quote, since narratives affect how we understand environmental problems and solutions, evaluate the ethical questions of risk distribution and access to resources, and imagine the connections between environmental degradation and other oppressions, they become a crucial component of environmental justice work, end quote. The three verbs central to the power of narrative Harrison advocates here open up wider and more nuanced conversations about the stra strategies and tools narrators have and relationships between readers and authors. Furthermore, Harrison's interest in how sentiment can remain a powerful political tool for environmental justice authors leads again to statements such as Ozeki's, quote, awareness of how storytelling shapes environmental knowledge and ignorance is crucial to enabling political action. Harrison's interest in storytelling's contributions to knowledge and ignorance dovetails well with David Vasquez's musings on Placencia, the people of paper, which take up that novel's experimental narrative structure and themes of toxicity. Vasquez's arguments amount to a reflection on author's narration and power that, along with Dickinson and Harrison, are part of the base here for my interest in multi-authored works. He writes that the novel's 
final undermining of the narrative signals a recognition that despite the exigencies of the novel form that require a level of omniscience to make sense of the story, one must continue to be suspicious of power. Indeed, the fact that authors ultimately do have power over even their plural narrators or complex narrative devices returns me to considerations from Polito about how iterations of environmental justice across forms of inquiry are tied up with racial projects. Individual authors represent even other groups' experiences partially, and such partiality is only reinforced when studies take up authorially aligned interpretive stances. As an eco-narratologist, I connect these problems of power and storytelling to live questions in narrative theory, which mostly have not crossed over into environmental justice. Um, within emerging critical race narratologies, however, Blake Wilder's cognitive science-based study of Jim Crow American narratives points out that race creates separate experiences of world and story, and thus the narrative choices of authors, narrators, readers, and characters may not so much bridge as proliferate worldviews to deliberate among. Wilder draws on David Herman's work to parse um, worlding the story and storying the world as separate processes that can help foreground issues of world making within narrative inquiry. End quote. Wilder's study, along with Aaron James's eco narratological work on story worlds and even more explicitly reader oriented approaches like the co construction work being advanced by uh, Malka Efron, Margarita McMurray, and Virginia Pignanoli all have bearing for interrogating how racial and ethnic understandings factor into literary scholarship on environmental justice narratives, and in particular these approaches' insistence on barriers to full knowability of another's worldview raises questions about the sufficiency of a sort of bilateral understanding when readers encounter a narrative from a single author whose intentions readers will attempt rightly or wrongly to glean. If we can combine existing work on environmental justice storytelling with narrative theory studying how multiple parties interact with narrative, works by single authors turn out to have asymptotic constraints when it comes to how much of environmental justice they are ultimately able to convey or give readers access to, or how much readers may willingly or successfully take away. On one hand, of course, multi-authored and collaborative texts only multiply these problems as they obviously add to the number of incomplete relationships involved. But I've become interested in multi-authored and collaborative works because, on one hand, they seem to me to offer layers and points of reference or triangulation that mitigate and enrich access readers have to narrative content. And in those cases where collaborations are multi-ethnic or multi-racial, the multiplicity of perspectives involved seems to me to disrupt the power dynamics between single authors and single readers. Points of relation and represented interests proliferate. Simultaneously, um, such collaborations thwart easy alignments between narratives and singular racial projects, and in that way may help readers recognize racial projects, their alignments, and their deviations from one another. Having taken on more than I can responsibly fit into this conference paper already, deep discussion of an example is outside the realm of possibility here. But I want to raise uh, the 1897 Citizen Bird scenes from Bird Life in Plain English for Beginners as just one example because of its collaboration. The text for this novelized birding guide was written by the highly regarded 19th century ornithologist Elliot Kuis and the writer uh, Mabel Osgood Wright, who eco-critics may best remember for her environmental activism, as discussed by Dan Philippon and among others. Um, it was also illustrated, however, by Luis Agassi Fuertes, a figure who I can only briefly gloss here as readable within the heuristic of the Latino 19th century. As personal correspondence among Fuertes and Kuis bears out, Fuertes' illustrations were tremendously influential in the volume's success. Furthermore, they strongly mediate the reader's mental access to the birds being discussed. As such, we might then begin to ask, what is the effect of these pictures and the Latino hand that drew them in a book that seeks to redress bird population decline through the racialized rhetoric of citizen birds? What does the multi-ethnic collaboration of this volume do that differs from the creative and activist work, say, of Mabel Osgood Wright on her own? And how do the artistic and activist contributions of Wright and Fuertes to the project inflect Kues's scientific orientation to bird identification? Citizen Bird is not the most environmental justice-inclined text we might start with, but I think it is an example of a forgotten work that could provide an interesting literary prehistory to later collaborations, such as poet June Jordan's collaboration with architect Buckminster Fuller on Skyrise for Harlem, to which Cheryl Fish has drawn attention. By reflecting... Um, 
on the long, deep roots of multi-ethnic and multiracial collaboration toward redress of injustices, repair of ecological damage, and visions of environmental justice, I argue such works present a necessary supplement to the single author-focused analyses that have typified literary scholarship on environmental justice. Thank you.